three sailors have been rushed to the Cairns Base Hospital after a gas leak on board a Navy patrol boat off the far northern coast. It's the third time in recent years that gas leaks have happened on naval ships. Previously, deaths have occurred. The sailors from the HMAS Townsville were overcome by gas while working near a cable locker. HMAS Townsville was on exercises in the Cairns exercise area and she was approximately 20 miles uh, east of Cairns when three of her ship's company were, uh, uh, were overcome by an unknown, unidentified gas. Uh, the ship uh, immediately returned to harbour and some 40 minutes later was alongside uh, the naval base here in Cairns, HMAS Cairns. Once ashore, the three men were taken to the Cairns base hospital where they're reported to be in a satisfactory condition. It will take 24 hours for the Townsville to be declared gas-free. According to Commander John Delaney, results of the initial investigation, which are expected to be known tomorrow afternoon, will determine the parallels between this and other recent gas leaks aboard naval vessels. Most definitely the results of the Board of Inquiry, or the Commanding Officer's Investigation rather, will be closely looked at to see whether there's any correlation between uh, this uh, particular gas incident and any previous ones. Well, do you think there's a danger for sailors and naval officers on board? There is always a danger for mariners at sea, uh, and of course, appropriate precautions are taken. Size about 30 kilometres from Cairns when three men began vomiting after inhaling gas. They'd been working near the ship's anchor locker. A Navy spokesman said all three had spent a comfortable night in Cairns Base Hospital. Two were discharged today. The third was due for release late today or early tomorrow. Yesterday's incident was the third time the Navy's had to admit gas problems aboard its ships. Two sailors died and more than 50 were hospitalised two months ago after a gas leak from sullage tanks aboard HMAS Stalwart off Darwin. In 1981, Naval Reserve Cadet Kevin Dax died after breathing gas on board HMAS Tobruk while it was moored off Brisbane. Investigators testing air samples should know what caused the latest gassing by midday tomorrow. Scientific team to the Australian base on Macquarie Island, 1,300 kilometres south of Hobart. It was a mission originally given to another ship which became trapped in Antarctic ice. There was time for a mild joke after 10 weeks of hard work and mixed fortunes. On its way home from a Far East deployment, Stalwart was suddenly asked to head from Subic Bay to Macquarie Island. The weather, the wind was 50, 60 knots. It was um, uh, backing, um, turning from north to south uh, in the space of two or three minutes. And um, one stage we're dragging anchor on, not a, not a very good holding ground, and, uh, and we had to move. And also we're connected to the shore with a uh, uh, fuel pipe, which uh, for pumping purposes to get the fuel on board. So it kept you on your toes all the time. Stalwart's arrival was a relief to the 20 Australian scientists who'd been there since September 1984. All the interesting food was just about exhausted, all our fresh frozen, there's still plenty of canned food, but Macquarie Island abounds with rabbit, so uh, rabbit was featuring on the menu quite frequently. We all jumped for joy, literally, seeing that uh, great grey hull on the horizon and this enormous helicopter coming in to... Uh, bring in our relief and our mail. The heroes were certainly the pilots who flew the Sea King on 130 cargo flights, transferring vital fuel supplies for the new wintering party. They flew in 60 knot winds with temperatures down to minus nine. And from the experienced campaigners, a word of caution to the Greenpeace expedition preparing to set up an Antarctic camp for the first time. It's one thing for the Navy to come to Macquarie Island, which any conventional can reach. It's another thing in Antarctica when you get into trouble and you need an ice strengthened vessel at least to get down there to pull you out. Anger and violence are building up a... ...hospitalised, with the last sailor, able seaman Paul Nobes, being released from the Cairns Base Hospital this morning. Base Commander John Delaney says air samples of the suspect compartment have been taken and sent to Sydney for testing. He says previous tests on surrounding compartments have proved inconclusive as to the origin and identity of the gas. Commenting on speculation that the gas may have come from a crack in a sewerage pipe, Commander Delaney says anything is possible, but nothing so far. Craft heavies, which were redeployed to Cairns, following the naval decision several months ago to run down the base in Brisbane. While three craft will remain in the NQEA yards on operational reserve, the two which arrived in Cairns today have been refurbished for a different role. They'll aid the Cairns-based survey ship Flinders in survey work of the Great Barrier Reef 
Coral Sea and Gulf of Carpentaria. Although the vessels were initially built for a different purpose, the Batano's commanding officer says they will play a valuable supporting role to the Flinders. We've already had some experience in using this ship, uh, both off uh, Bowen earlier in the year and in the Cape Flattery area back in September. And we've found that the output we're getting is quite satisfactory for the type of vessel that it actually is. Obviously, one has a purpose-built ship, it uh, performs far better for its function. But these ships, I think, are going to do an excellent role in the North Queensland waters. They've got certain capabilities which this ship hasn't got. We can go on and off the beaches. We can carry a lot of cargo to set up camps for Flinders. Um, so I think as a versatile vessel, not necessarily putting out as much survey output as Flinders, we've got a, an excellent supporting role to look forward to. Coming up right after this break, the Navy celebrates its 75th birthday. The Australian Navy got into the swing of celebrating its 75th anniversary this year with a show of strength off the northern coast. The Navy's Cairns-based patrol boat flotilla conducted a day-long series of manoeuvres and tactical demonstrations in the waters around Magnetic Island near Townsville. It was a day designed specifically for the Navy to strut its stuff in front of a captive audience of local VIPs and media representatives. The four Fremantle-class patrol boats, HMAS Townsville, Ipswich, Bendigo and Gladstone, steamed out of Townsville Harbour this morning, intent on impressing their guests. And impressed they did. Throughout the days, the crews were kept at their posts, while either individually, in pairs or as a flotilla, the vessels were put through their paces. The uh, ship which is conducting the uh, exercise, or the serial, uh, chooses a, a selection of those uh, manoeuvres and uh, he then uh, uh, pushes out to all the other ships each manoeuvre as it's about to occur. When each ship has uh, uh, receded and understood uh, that manoeuvre, uh, he will then execute the manoeuvre and the ships uh, will carry out whatever that manoeuvre is. What you're seeing here, Chris, is a towing exercise. Uh, we practice it uh, with other naval ships uh, in case we uh, have to tow them or in fact any other vessel which we find which uh, could be disabled. Of course all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy and for the crew on board the Royal Australian Naval Patrol boats the light relief comes in the form of an unusual exercise known as fleet drills. They've got uh, two, two uh, good points uh, in that they, they really do uh, as you've seen today foster a bit of initiative. Uh, it's the guy who's got that initiative that's going to get in a few moments before the other ship and it also helps, uh, helps uh, foster that competitive... Uh, competitive that was the year Australia's fledgling naval forces first took to the water. Well, as you'd expect, quite a few changes have occurred since those early days. And in the waters off North Queensland this week, local naval forces showed their operation to the media in honour of the occasion. Chris Hill reports. Happy birthday. As you may have guessed, 1986 is a special year for the Royal Australian Navy. It's its 75th birthday, and while the only northern naval base is stationed in Cairns, its staff are determined to ensure that as many people as possible have the opportunity to get to know a little more about the nautical force. This week, the four Fremantle-class patrol boats based in Cairns, HMA ships Townsville, Bendigo, Ipswich and Gladstone, left their home port for just such a purpose. Dignitaries and media representatives in Townsville were treated to a day on board the vessels in what was codenamed Operation Shop Window. Now, our program's been put together to, to allow us a couple more opportunities in this guy in Gladstone, Mackay and the next couple of months. What else do the Navy have on the, on the plans for the celebrations this year? Uh, mainly um, we're interested in the Cairns and the, the Queensland area. Um, we've got a lot of activities with uh, major vessels visiting us later in the year. Um, our Navy Week will be a, a bigger than normal event this year in, in Cairns and we're hoping to um, be involved in, in more of the, the things that we don't often get involved in, like the starts of yacht races and uh, other activities where the Navy can be seen at its, um, its sparkling best. 
The patrol boats are exceptional vessels, manned by 22 crew, including officers, and measuring 42 metres, you can well imagine they're like floating close-knit communities. They're among the smallest vessels commissioned in the Navy, but that doesn't apply to their stature. The very nature of their operations mean they log the most sea time, with two-week maintenance breaks in between six-week patrols. They're called on to perform in numerous tasks. The most publicised of those would be the apprehension of illegal fishing vessels and are required to be constantly proficient and efficient, hence this operation. What you're about to see now is known as a heaving line transfer, a manoeuvre that requires exceptional skill with the vessels in such close proximity. You can see she's come down in speed now and she's uh, paralleling our course and slowing down to our speed. And uh, they're going to be using a, a heaving line. They're swinging it now on the pokes all over to us. It is a difficult, uh, difficult seaman evolution. He's got the first one over now. We'll see them now uh, attach that uh, to a heavier line. You can see them doing that now. And it's that line that any stores which would be uh, sent across in the real situation uh, would be attached to. Many an unfortunate Taiwanese fishing vessel have been on the receiving end of this particular exercise. What you're seeing here, Chris, is a towing exercise. Uh, we practice it uh, with other naval ships uh, in case we uh, have to tow them or in fact any other vessel which we find which uh, could be disabled. Just a brief look at Operation Shop Window. An interesting sideline to this story comes in the form of one Sub-Lieutenant Mark Sorby. Mark is part of an exchange program the Northern Base is running with the Fijian Navy. The purpose of it uh, really is for the benefit of, um, of both countries having that, um, that variety in, uh, in training in two different uh, types of ships with two different types of um, naval organisation I suppose. We run minesuivers in the Fijian Navy and, um, and these are Fremantle class patrol boats and um, and uh, I really wouldn't have the chance to serve on one at home and uh, and of course I'm getting the benefit of that uh, while I'm here and uh, likewise with my counterpart in Fiji. The patrol boats have now returned to their base in Cairns but not before making quite an impression and I suppose all that remains to be said is happy birthday but for the very long the smaller boats the fluky winds around the high peak of Pentecost Island was make or break start. Scored breaking wind the start. Less than an hour into the race, she'd left her small arrivals well behind. Among them was Gretel, Australia's first America's Cup challenger, followed closely by Southern Cross. Eighty yachts sailing in four divisions battled it out over the 24 nautical mile course through the Whitsunday's Dent Passage. However, a broken rudder discovered just before the official start put an end to Rizulu's chances of taking out the International Offshore Racing Division on handicap. A multi-hole division has been added to this year's seven race series, attracting about 20 boats, including entries from New Zealand. Conditions today were a far cry from those experienced last year, where the lack of wind nearly crippled the series. However, another strong southerly breeze is expected tomorrow for two separate 15 nautical mile races. Ex-servicemen and women and young Australians stood in silence to remember the casualties of war. In particular, those who died on that early morning 71 years ago when the Anzacs scrambled ashore at Gallipoli. It was one of the biggest dawn services in years. And although a familiar tradition, whether they be veterans of the Great War, World War II, Korea or Vietnam, for some, there is no forgetting. But a few hours later, those same faces told of pride and past glory as the Anzac Day March wound its way through the city streets. The marches numbered about 25,000, veterans from the Australian Combined Services, as well as old allies from Britain and New Zealand, the United States, Poland, Yugoslavia and South Vietnam. The Navy, celebrating its 75th anniversary, was well represented, but it was the dwindling numbers of original diggers, the men who fought in World War I, whose presence seemed to have the most effect. The march will finish at 12.30, when a united commemoration service will be held in Hyde Park. Cold and gusty conditions in Melbourne didn't deter about 3,000 people, many of them children, from attending the dawn service at the Shrine of Remembrance. The Catholic Bishop for the Australian Defence Forces conducted the 20-minute ceremony, which was followed by wreath-laying. 
People were still filing slowly past the shrine more than an hour after the last post had sounded. Melbourne's major Anzac service began at 10 o'clock this morning with a march through the city, which will culminate in a commemoration ceremony at the shrine. At the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, an estimated crowd of between four and 5,000 turned out for the dawn service. With the temperature hovering around six degrees, many of those attending had to take their place on the steps outside. Let it not be in vain that they have died in the cause of right the Catholic Bishop to the Australian Armed Forces, Geoffrey Main, led the crowd in prayer and later this morning Governor General Saninian Stephen will take part in a wreath laying service at the memorial. In Brisbane this morning, the mild weather drew a large crowd to the traditional dawn service at Anzac Square. Wreaths were laid by the eternal flame and memories of those who died in Australia's conflicts etched in the faces of those who will never forget. Queensland's Governor-General, Sir Walter Campbell, addressed the crowd, saying people should never forget the men who first bequeathed Australia the precious gift of the Anzac spirit. Despite rain in Hobart, a record gathering of 300 paid their tributes at a traditional ceremony. <laughs> For the fifth consecutive year, the service was conducted by retired Anglican priest Nat Summers, blind from birth, using Braille to flawlessly deliver a moving speech. Among the gathering were men and women from combined services both now and past. Many of the long-time dawn service goers say this year there appeared to be many more children than past years. The Anzac Day almost started with tragedy for a group of celebrants in the Adelaide suburb of Norwood. They were gathered for a reef laying when a car lost control coming around a corner at high speed and struck five people. None were seriously injured, but a young boy suffered suspected broken limbs and was rushed to Royal Adelaide Hospital. But the main dawn service went perfectly despite the threat of rain, which held off just long enough for the ceremony's completion. The Duchess of Windsor, whose love... Taking the salute was the commander of Laverack, Brigadier Harris. The main parade was led by lone Gallipoli veteran Robert Mackay Lindsay, who still looked surprisingly sprightly at the age of 89. A large contingent of servicemen from the 3rd Task Force stepped off, led by the North Queensland Army Band. Units from the RAAF base at Garbutt and from the Royal Australian Navy base at Cairns also joined the colourful march along the Strand. Although the representation from the First and Second World Wars was noticeably smaller than in past years, there was a larger contingent marching under the banner of the Vietnam Veterans Association. Following the parade, those taking part were joined by relatives and friends for the special commemorative service at the Cenotaph. The Anglican Bishop, the Reverend John Lewis, led the prayer of remembrance and read a passage of scripture before delivering the Anzac Day address. Representatives from service and community organisations then laid wreaths at the Cenotaph before the customary playing of the last post and the two minute silence in remembrance of those who'd fallen. full roundup of Anzac Day. The reason was the inclusion of a group of French ex-servicemen now living in Queensland. building on the Esplanade to the Shire Hall. A large contingent of war veterans from conflicts including the Italy and Vietnam were joined by members of the current day armed forces. Youth was also strongly represented by school, scouting and sporting groups. 
For the elite part of this year's march was the intrusion of 10 members of the French ex-servicemen's organisation, some travelling from as far afield as Cooktown in Brisbane to participate in the parade. Taking part in, uh, in, uh, in campaign with the Australian forces in 1939, 40, etc., you know, and uh, uh, it is very significant for us, you know, because we live in Australia. I think it's very really important for us to, uh, to take part of the uh, ceremony on our land. Following the march, a civic ceremony jointly organised by the RSL and the Johnston Shire Council was conducted in the Shire Hall, where guest speaker Lieutenant Jeff Alston from HMAS Brunei spoke about the Anzac spirit. We must never forget the horror and the destruction of war. Similar sentiments were also expressed in three resolutions presented at the meeting by Shire Chairman Ross Overton and students from the Innisfail and Good Council School. A Northern MP believes the Federal Anzac prevailed in Cairns today. The 71st Anzac Day saw one of the biggest parades in years. Prior to the march making its way through the city streets, large crowds of onlookers had begun to take up the traditional vantage points in the vicinity of Munro Martin Park. At precisely 10.45 the parade moved out and made its way along the esplanade toward the marshalling area for the official ceremony. Again, as in past years, the diggers of the war to end all wars moved into the park first to the applause of an enthusiastic crowd. Again, as in previous years, the comments from those watching were ones of sadness, as the links with the true meaning of Anzac looked even thinner. This year, in recognition of the 75th anniversary of the formation of the Royal Australian Navy, the role of leading the parade was given to the men and women of the naval base HMAS Cairns. The parade leader was the officer in charge, Commander John Delaney. Then came the diggers of the Second World War, the men and women representing all sections of the services. Forming a group of their own were the survivors of the famous Rats of Trabrook Siege, one of the turning points for the Allied forces in the Second War. Possibly one of the most unusual aspects of this year's parade was a unit of American servicemen who marched under the United States flag. The group ranged from ex-US naval personnel through to members of the Marine Corps. All were holidaying in the North and decided to join their former wartime allies for today's ceremony. Anzac Day continues to play a unique role in the history of Australia and New Zealand. Who could forget the tragedy and suffering? Gallipoli claimed the lives of more than 30,000 of our soldiers and a further 80,000 were wounded and 8,000 were listed as missing. The Anzac Day tradition will indeed perpetuate the ideals of peace and freedom. The day has been preserved as a national sentinel which will over the years has gained international recognition. Traditionally in Cairns, the Anzac Day ceremony finishes when a surviving digger of the Great War hands over the flame of Anzac to a serving member of the Australian Armed Forces. At today's ceremony, Private George Payne passed on the spirit of that first Anzac Day to Private G.P. Johnson of the Cairns-based Army Reserve. He, in turn, vowed to keep it safe in memory of those who'd made the supreme sacrifice. In an historic link-up, North Queensland Television and Cairns-based Radio Force... cherish the Australian way of life and I am sure if it hadn't been for the sacrifice laid down by those who did not return and those who were maimed, wounded and in Another is on a goodwill mission to the north as part of the Navy's 75th anniversary. The two old stalwarts of the Navy's destroyer force made their way into the Cairns Inlet this morning. Commissioned in 1964, the river-class destroyer escort HMAS Derwent is armed with two 4.5-inch radar-controlled guns, a CCAT guided missile system and the ICARA anti-submarine missile system. The daring-class destroyer HMAS Vampire, which was commissioned in 1959, has been operating as a training ship for both officers and sailors for the past six years. 
However, the Navy's oldest currently serving vessel will be decommissioned in August. It's always a sad day when we lose any ships, uh, but I guess we have to accept that uh, times are getting tight and manpower is money and uh, the crew of this vessel are needed elsewhere in the Navy at the moment and so she is being paid off about two years earlier than we'd originally intended. While both vessels will be open for public display in Cairns tomorrow, 12 of the Vampire crew will be running to Townsville to raise money for charity. Cairns and then Townsville will be our last Australian ports before returning to Sydney in June and uh, they've decided they would make a large uh, charity attempt here and donate as much money as possible to the Bush Children's Health Scheme. A conference dealing with women's education, training and... ...tragic death of an elderly man during the visit of an Australian submarine to the South Island city of Nelson. The 67-year-old and the 15-year-old girl were visiting the sub when the gangplank they were on gave way. The HMAS Orion's flags were flying at half-mast today. She's on a port visit to Nelson and yesterday afternoon was open to the public. Around 3.30, tragedy struck. The submarine's rear gangplank toppled, throwing 67-year-old William Massey and a 15-year-old girl into the sea. The girl was unhurt. Mr Massey was pulled out of the water alive but died from his injuries. The Australian Navy says the gangway was the craft's own and had been rigged by the Orion's crewmen. There's no criticism of the facilities and staff of the local Nelson Harbour Board. The sub's captain, Commander Kim Pitt, says the accident's drawn an understandable cloud over the port visit. The Navy's great patrol boat race in Sydney has arrived back in Cairns. The HMAS Townsville defeated three other boats from around Australia in the race, which was part of the Navy's 75th anniversary. As the HMAS Townsville steamed into the Cairns Inlet this morning, a small welcoming party was on hand at the naval base to congratulate the crew on their efforts in the great patrol boat race earlier this month in Sydney. The race consisted of a series of patrol boat operations and then a sprint to the finishing line at Sydney Heads. As the Townsville birthed though, it was obvious modern technology had even entered the hallow sphere of naval tradition. Instead of hoisting a broom to signify a clean sweep in winning a competition, it was a vacuum cleaner. However, representatives of the boat's sponsors, Qantas and Castlemaine Tuies, and base commander John Delaney, joined the crew on board for a presentation and celebration. Even though the old boat was heavier than the others in the race, Lieutenant Commander Dennis Collier revealed the secret to its success. After the Hamilton Island Yacht Race series, we picked up a few hints from Windward Passage and uh, managed to get the right start. Um, we had right of way and speed up at the start and, and definitely won the start, which uh, put us ahead. And what better way to celebrate than downing a drop of the sponsor's amber fluid?